Welcome to Field Sports Britain. Coming up, we're here at the British Grand Prix for Helice, and if you don't know what Helice is, you better stay and watch and find out. We're with Mike Yardley at one of the country's top pheasant shoots, learning how to shoot more accurately. We're down in the West Country, protecting crops from pigeons. But first, the Ashdown Forest in the southeast of England has got a problem. Deer, and we know a man to sort it out. If you're fortunate enough to land yourself a piece of ground to stalk on, you'd better make sure you do a decent job. The last thing a landowner with a deer problem wants is to see deer he's asked you to remove destroying his prize-winning veggies. Colin Hinckley and Dom Holtam are stalking partners, and this morning we're tiptoeing along the path leading to fields behind the farm. They've only been here a few times, and although they've seen fallow deer and a few row, they haven't been able to get into a good enough position. They need to start making an impression. There's another deer that we've just spotted that's between us and the target one, which might stop us getting into a shooting position. Knowing the land you're stalking is vitally important when you're using a high-powered rifle but there are now new ways of familiarising yourself with the ground from every angle. There's no substitute for knowing your ground, you know, for actually getting out there and, uh, and walking the ground, finding out where the footpaths are, where any buildings might be, where you're likely to encounter people. Um, but obviously there is technology now that can, that can help you. And, uh, you know, a lot of modern phones like this one have a map function on there and it allows you to pick out certain features that might be useful, whether it's a, a block of woodland where you think that the deer might hold, um, or a building that might be on someone else's land that you hadn't realised was there. It's a great way of, of kind of prioritising certain areas on, an, on a new block of land that you might not have been to before. Back to the job in hand and Colin spots a row doe and two fallow bucks. The bucks start moving towards the cover of the wood. Colin then decides to move into the field. A quick look and we crawl along the hedgerow. We stop. He hopes that the buck we've been stalking will work its way round to us because we are now between him and the garden. Here's breakfast. Colin shoots and the buck drops like a stone. A fraction of a second later, the second buck appears and stops. It spotted Dom, who's a hundred yards behind us. Colin takes his chance, and another accurate chest shot drops him too. The landowner is going to be a happy man. Venison with fresh vegetables is definitely anyway. on the menu. We'll just touch the guy. Yep. All right, I'm just going to bleed it now. It's a tricky old spot because you've got golf course all the way around you, so you've really got to try and, like, we got a little wee bit higher than them and the shot was straight down, in, you know, into that bank behind this fern. I know the bank's behind it because we walked it before and checked it during the daylight, so we knew it was a safe shot. I mean, he's, he's only just in velvet, but he's a very, very poor head. Nice carcass, nice, you know, nice beast, but we don't get very good heads around here and that's a classic case of not a very good one. But um, that's the job done, so hopefully the farmer will be quite happy. There was a row out here, we haven't got very many row round here at all, but there was one out here, which is a bit of a bonus really. We'll leave them and hope that they build up in numbers and hope they don't get shot elsewhere. But two for the price of one call. Yeah, well, that was always handy, it's always a bonus. I didn't expect to get the other one, but he did come up over the, two, over the brow and I thought, well, we are here to do a job. It's not very sporting, but we are here to do a job. And again, up the top of there is a very big bank behind that thing. So it was, and again, it was another safe shot. So I thought, right, well, we are here to do a job, so let's take it and do it. So hopefully the farmer will be happy now. But I'm just get these back to the chiller because I've only got half an hour to get these back to the chiller, get them grallocked before the carcass spoils. So I'll nip back and get the lamb rover and we'll load them up. The bucks are in great condition but have poor heads. 
two, three. Always to take care that you don't whack yourself with an ant when you're loading them up. There you go, job done. They're not going to garlic them here, but take them back to their yard and specially adapted container. A great facility if you've got the space and a bit of imagination. I went to a place that um, they do a lot of carcass preparation and everything. And I, I said to the lady there, I really need to get myself a chiller. I've seen them, you know, advertised in the shooting times all over the place. And um, she said, they're a lot of money that way. She said, really what you need to do is go and find a lorry breakers that's breaking refrigerated lorries. If you go and find one of them that's breaking refrigerated lorries, you should, you can buy them quite cheaply. Well, I bought this one, the whole thing. It didn't have this, I did just shorten it up and put, put a petition into it, but it was £100 for the whole lot, and it cost me 20 quid for somebody to come and bring it home for me. And um, luck would have it, all the motors and everything on it, it all worked. So all we had to do was section it off, put this division in, make the door, put the door in, um, we made the A-frame, stuck all the, all the hooks and everything on it, welded it all into place, and the job was a good one. The motors and everything worked, so it, it was instant refrigerator. So I can get six or seven deer in there, two or three hundred rabbits when I need to, um, and it was the cheapest way of doing it that I could find, really. As well as filling the freezer with some nice joints, Colin and Dom are also bagging some blood. They have two young hounds that need training. Colin's just got a Bavarian hound, um, and I've just got a Slovakian pointer. Um, and the idea is to train them up to uh, to do a bit of deer work with us. Um, so I think the Bavarian's about 15 weeks, so it's, uh, it's just, just beginning to get started with kind of basic training. Obviously, if we can freeze a bit of blood, um, always useful to have as backup for laying trails and stuff to get them started on, the, on their training. The deer are both healthy specimens and everyone is happy. There you go, that's from the field to the chiller in less than an hour. Um, it's, a nice, it's a nice carcass, it's you know lovely condition, real nice condition deer. We don't get very good heads around here, they just, you know, it's just, we just don't. Um, but it's a you know, nice clean carcass, ready to go in the chiller. I'll obviously tag that so that um, we know which carcass it is, where it was shot. I'll enter the records in, into my record book. I'll check through the Gralic in a minute and make sure that everything says it should be and that there's no signs of disease or anything wrong with it. But pretty much, that's the job done. So we'll hang it in the chiller, turn the chiller on, job's a good one. If you're up to your eyes in oilseed rape, you'll need these guys to keep down the pigeons. The shooter on the right, Steve, has come here to North Somerset at the invitation of pest controller Rob Collins, who runs the Woodspring Shooting Club. Rob found Steve and almost all the guns out shooting today on the internet, on Facebook. Well, it is a triumph for Facebook, yeah. Well, um, like I say, we've got the shooting club, obviously, and the spin-off from that is everybody was interested in the shooting club, especially since the last great one we did on this farm with the filming. Yeah. And so we prompted us to make the supporters group up the Woodspring of Wild Island supporters group. Steve met me through your show and actually got in contact with me through Facebook and joined the group. And uh, on, the, on the day, we've got Steve here. You're from uh, Ilminster, isn't it? Yeah. Ilminster. Yeah. We've got Sean Jenkins, an officer on the group as well. You've got an officer on the group. He's from Ross on Wye. You've got Sam Wilkinson and Ryan Tidswell. They're down from Hull. And we've also got Dad and Ryan from the shooting club here as well. So we've got a good old mix up. We're having a good old camp out this weekend. This is the rape. So you'll see rape is just at the point of being ripe. So they're going to be harvesting it any day. As soon as we get a little bit of dry weather, they'll be harvesting this. Um, but the way the pigeons are hitting it, I mean, you know, a couple of hundred birds were here this morning, spread out through here. I mean, it's not going to take them long to eat, to eat through this field. And there's several other fields around. One field just over there is completely lost to pigeons. They, they basically just whole cropped it and just fed it to the animals because they've lost the whole crop. Like I said they've been darting backwards forwards all day. Um, you know, like I say, the boys over there, they, they're like a load of old gunners in World War II. They haven't stopped banging away. I say it's Ryan's 17th birthday. He's over there with Sean Jenkins on the other wood. And again, they're having some great sport over there. We've got a 
massive glut of pigeons in this last couple of years. Um, further into Downson, South Somerset, they haven't got hardly any. They're not seeing any pigeons, they're all up here. Yeah. Um, and again, the crops are really, really getting smashed. So every pigeon shooter in the area is out every waking time they can just to keep the birds from eating them little black balls. Uh, yeah, well, basically, this is the second one we've done. The first one we did was in Wales. And uh, we went to Wales and there was about, oh, I think about eight to ten of us went over there. And they had a real big problem over there. They'd, we had corvids and rabbits. They couldn't grow any grass. 800 acres uh, my friend had. And he couldn't grow an ounce of grass for the, for the cattle. Um, Steve, you've got some dropping around behind you here. Coming over the ash tree. Go for it. Took the tail feathers out of that one. And we spent our oh, best part of, I don't know, about seven to eight days over there. Uh, and we were shooting morning, noon and night. We were out uh, roost shooting on the rooks and the crows and the corvids. We did over 200 corvids in less than two hours in the roost shoot. And that was between about 10 of us. And that was the Wales one. And then, you know, this was my turn to host this one. I believe either uh, Wayne Binks is going to um, host a ferreting one for us up yeah. in Scarborough. Gerald Humphreys is going to, uh, we've got to go over to his big shoot over in Buckinghamshire. Mm -hmm. He wants us to go over there and do some vermin control. So that's another one that's on the cards of booked. We're also going up with Sam Wilkinson up to Hull. And we're going to do some pigeon shooting and uh, help out on the estate that he works on. He's a keeper on. So yeah, you know, it's going to, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of plans for going around the country, getting people meeting up. We're just a, group, a bunch of lads. We enjoy ourselves. We're lads like you, me and everyone else. And there's girls. I mean, the young shots and everyone, we've got a lot of young shots. There were a lot of birds moving about, but they were flying high. Cartridge to kill ratio was poor, and the final bag was only double figures. But the guns loved it, even when they missed. We've considered how to hold the gun. Let's consider now how we should stand. And let's start by keeping it very simple. Let's imagine that I'm shooting at 12 o'clock to my front, in other words, directly into the camera. Here's a simple way to get into a good shooting position. I'm assuming you're a right-hander firing off the right shoulder. Stand square to where you're going to shoot. Take half a pace forward onto your right foot. And there we are in a perfect natural shooting position. Front shoulder, front hip, ball of the front foot, all in a straight line. Let me show you that from the side. There I am in my starting position, standing square, half a pace forward onto the front foot, and there we are, front shoulder, front hip, ball of the front foot, all in a straight line. If you're a left-hander, it's exactly the same but of course you're bringing your right foot forward. So half a pace forward onto the right foot. And there we are again, perfect position, front shoulder over the front foot. One thing I have a bee in my bonnet about is taking guns from slips safely. Often you see people handling guns in slips in a very sloppy fashion. Here's the right way. Unzip the slip or unbuckle it, take your hand, flatly along the side of the stock, extend your hand, finger, trigger finger on the trigger guard, barrel secured at the front, barrel still pointing in a safe direction. I open the top lever and I've broken the gun before I've taken it out of the slip. And there it is, look for daylight, clear gun. Coming on to another subject, how we should hold the gun. It's amazing, you see people who've been shooting all their lives and for some reason or other have never learnt to hold the gun properly. I'm going to close the gun under control. Let's consider rear hand position first. Here's a way of getting your hand in the right place that you simply can't get it wrong. Put your hand, the palm of your hand, flat on the butt. Just slide forward. There I am, perfect position on the grip. At the moment, my trigger finger is extended onto the trigger guard. When I bring the trigger finger onto the trigger, I like to put the pad, the pad of the finger, 
on the trigger. Some people prefer the first joint. So, that's front hand position, palm on the butt, slide forward into a comfortable natural position, thumb is well wrapped around the grip, and the error that you see that some people have got into the habit of doing is instead of having their hand there, they end up with their hand too high on the grip. And if you do that, you can never mount the gun properly. If the gun is natural with your body, the hand there is in a natural position, everything happens naturally. Now let's think about the front hand. Well, on this over and under, a William Evans St James's, nice checkering here. It's not just there for decoration, it's there to improve your purchase. And you can see from where the checkering is that it's designed to have your hand in a midway position. So you don't want to have your hand back here. You also don't want to overextend the front arm. You'll see some people imitating the style of George V, who used to have a straight front arm. And it became a fashion before the Second World War, and some people still do it. They extend that front arm. The problem with extending that front arm is that you can't swing easily. If the gun in a nice comfy position in your hands, you've got a nice fluent swing. If you overextend the front arm, you're going to end up checking your own swing. So that's a bad idea. Another important subject is loading the gun. Now, as ever, check that the barrels are unobstructed and you can see daylight. Take your cartridges and we've checked that they're suitable for the gun. Load your chambers and now close the gun under control in a safe direction and pointing into the ground. I like to secure the stock against my tummy. I use my arm to do that. I close the gun under control and then if anything untoward should happen the gun would make a hole in the ground and not in a person. I often make this demonstration with the 12 bore just to show how powerful it is and to show how careful you should be when you handle a gun because just imagine if that wasn't mud and grass but if that was someone's chest. You're in charge, you're responsible, when you pull the trigger it's down to you. It's clay pigeons, Jim, but not as we know it. I went to the British Haley's Grand Prix, organised by gun shop owner Chris Potter at the West Kent Shooting School, not far from London. Haley's, also called ZZ, are the strangest flying targets shot in competition. Here's why they're so peculiar. The heli started originally as live pigeon shooting, which of course was the first type of competition shooting. In the 1920s, live pigeon shooting was banned. And then over time into the 60s, 70s, this, form, this sport became available in Europe as a replication of the live pigeon shooting. When Princess Grace arrived in Monte Carlo, where all the big pigeon shoots were, she didn't like it, so she banned pigeon shooting. Well, thousands of people came from all over the world to shoot at Monte Carlo. So a Belgian count tried to invent something that would fly like a live bird, which is ZZ, or Halise as we call it now today, which means propeller. The first design he had, we thought it was ZZ for zigzag of the flight, but we later found out it stood for Zinc Zorito. The pigeon they used to shoot was a special pi bread pigeon called Zorito, and the first targets he made were out of zinc. So ZZ came from Zinc Zorito. For many years we thought ZZ for zigzag, but we were wrong. Anyhow, Halise is now the name that the French have put on it, meaning propeller, which we all shoot and live with now. Uh, here today we're shooting the British Grand Prix. We started yesterday, we shot 18 targets yesterday. Fairly leisurely. It's a visible sport, it's a very watchable sport. It's the second and final day of the Grand Prix and Mike Winsley is in the lead. This is a pressure sport, isn't it? It certainly is. This particular discipline is very 
Much so, yeah. Now you're leading after the end of day one with 18 straight, six still to shoot. How do you feel? Um, relatively composed, I suppose. Only got seven to shoot, but anything can happen. You know, it's the second day. First day is one thing, but to come out again after a night's sleep, thinking about it, is totally different. But everyone counts. You know, you can't afford to miss one in this game. It's it, that's the way it is. That's the nature of the sport. As the competitors line up to shoot the last few targets, we ask Gillian Lynch, who runs West Kent Shooting School with her husband Michael, what it means to be the centre of British Haley's shooting. We've been holding Haley's now for well, 32 years, not on actually on this side, but 32 years. Michael's father, Patrick Lynch, brought it in from Belgium in 1978 and they held the first British Grand Prix um, in 1978. The Grand Prix reaches its climax oh. with Mike Wensley in a shoot-off for the men's senior prize. Oh. Not only against another of the men's seniors, but against the ladies' champion, Dion Rogers, and the incredibly talented junior champion, Nathan Hales. The pressure is on Mike. It reaches a sudden death final. He just has to keep hitting them to win. And he misses. Nathan's dad, Colin Hales, takes the men's senior prize. A great day for the Hales family. But he too is beaten to the overall prize by Dion, and she's elated. So Dion, this is the second time you've won this. It, it is, yes. You must be pretty happy. I'm ecstatic. <laughs> I'm really happy. When was the last time? Uh, to win it overall uh, was back in, uh, I think, 1998. And that's winning, that's beating all the men, all the juniors, everybody. Yeah, yeah. Because it was, I mean, in the final final, there were two men, a junior and you. Yeah, yeah. Is it, is it a bit unfair that you can't go away with some of the silverware that the men get? No, not really. You enter as uh, a lady, a junior, or uh, obviously a guy, and uh, that's your place. But, you know, we are, whether you're a junior, a lady, a veteran, you are able to take the overall title. And that's what you've done. And that's what I've done. So you yeah. must be brilliant. Yeah, well, I'm absolutely over the moon. Are you going, uh, are you going on to compete internationally? Uh, yeah, we're off to Seville at the end of September for the European Championships. And that's Helice. That's Helice. Yep. Also, Good. Yeah. And you work for Chris Potter Guns, and, and, and Chris Potter has really taken this sport very seriously over the years, hasn't he? Absolutely, yeah. I've, I've been shooting this for 30 years. Um, both Chris and I are one of the sort of founder members of, uh, of Halee shooting in Great Britain. So, uh, Along with the Lynches here at West Kent. Absolutely, yeah. So, so yeah. You, you as a sort of Kentish gang. Yeah, I mean, Pat Lynch was the guy who brought Halee to, to the UK. And obviously we were all very close. Um, Pat had his shooting school, Chris had his shop. Uh, I worked for Chris since I was very young. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's, that's how we grew up. Let's just see that shot again. Well, that's it for Helice from the southeast of England. We're back next week with Grouse and Stags in Scotland. This has been Field Sports Britain, and I'd better get a move on. <laughs>